Hi everyone, welcome to Virtual New England Bible Church. We're glad you're able to join us today. If uh, you've arrived at this video because somebody from the church uh, shared it with you, then a special warm welcome to you. Uh, we hope you will be blessed and encouraged. Uh, well, today is Palm Sunday and we enter the Easter season where we particularly think upon our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ's uh, suffering, his death, burial, and resurrection. So as we will come to worship God today, let's turn our thoughts and our minds to him um, and that precious gift that he gave us through his son. Our call to worship comes from Psalm, Psalm 66, verses 1 through 4. Psalm 66 says this, Make a joyful shout to God, all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power, your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. Amen. Let's worship our God this morning. Two, three, four. You 
Amen. What a blessing to be able to use technology to gather our whole team together to sing that song, Hosanna, the God who saves. Let's continue our worship. Lord of 
Hey everybody, good to see you. Glad you can join us today for our online service here at New England Bible Church. I really appreciate all the feedback that you've been sending to us through text and email and phone calls. Uh, we love that you are able to um, watch these services um, online in your homes. Uh, I got a lot of great pictures this week. I just want to share with you one picture, uh, perhaps a future YouTube sensation. This was sent in from the Smith family. And uh, you can see there a couple of their kids standing in front of their TV watching last week's service. And uh, at least for me, first ever person listening to a sermon while on a hoverboard. And so a shout out to uh, Charlie Smith there. Uh, but I really appreciate the, the pictures. Um, love that you're all able to join us while you're drinking your coffee and uh, in your pajamas or your sweatpants sitting on the couch. And um, I'm just so happy that we can still be together in this way until we can be back here in this sanctuary in person, um, hopefully sometime soon. But if you have your Bibles this morning, I want to invite you to turn to the Gospel of Luke. We're going to study uh, Luke chapter 19 for a few minutes and talk about uh, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. And so we're going to read uh, several verses this morning, Luke chapter 19, and we will pick it up uh, in verse 28. And it reads like this. It says, uh, When he had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And it came to pass, when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mountain called Olivet, that he sent two of his disciples, saying, Go into the village opposite you, where as you enter you will find a colt tied, on which no one has ever sat. Loose it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, Why are you loosing it? Thus you shall say to him, because the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went their way and found it just as he had said to them. But as they were loosing the colt, the owners of it said to them, Why are you loosing the colt? And they said, The Lord has need of him. And then they drew him to Jesus, and they threw their own clothes on the colt, and they set Jesus on him. And as he went, many spread their clothes on the road. And then as he went now, uh, then as he was now drawing near the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, quote, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. But he answered and said to them, I tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Now as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it, saying, If you had known, even you, especially in this your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side, and level you, and your children within you, to the ground. And they will not leave in you one stone upon another, because you did not know the time of your visitation. And so we have um, a, re a re record here of Christ. Um, his entry into uh, Jerusalem. Uh, today is uh, commonly referred to as Palm Sunday. Uh, it's the beginning of uh, Passion Week, or what we sometimes call Holy Week. And of course, it, um, it ultimately leads to um, Christ's uh, arrest, his trial, um, the suffering, the cross, the burial, and then the resurrection. And next Sunday, we will be celebrating Resurrection Sunday uh, together. But here in uh, Luke 19, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a colt. And the response of the people is overwhelming. They're cheering for him. They're shouting. Uh, there's certainly a lot of joy. Uh, and in fact, they uh, recite a verse from Psalm 118. It's a messianic psalm. It's talking about uh, Jesus the Messiah who would one day come to save. And they say it right there in verse 38. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. 
peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And they give him this wild reception, which is usually, usually reserved only for a king. And it tells us that they laid down their coats, uh, they laid down their garments, and they uh, covered the pathway. They broke off palm branches from nearby trees. Uh, they didn't even want the uh, feet of this colt that Jesus was riding to touch the dirt on this road. And so they gave him this great reception. And while they're shouting out Hosanna, I don't know if they knew it or not, but they were actually fulfilling a, a prophecy that Zechariah had given nearly five centuries before. Listen to this verse from Zechariah uh, chapter uh, 9. Zechariah uh, 9.9, 9, it says this. It says, it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. And so Jesus, at that moment, was fulfilling this prophecy given nearly five centuries before. So this is kind of like our modern version of a ticker tape parade, or uh, particularly in Boston when the duck boats, when they load up all the players from whatever team has just won a championship, and they go through the streets of Boston. And some of you have been down there for those parades, and you've seen the players, and they're smiling, and the coaches, and the owners, and... Uh, families of everyone on those duck boats, and there's just a lot of smiles and a lot of cheering. But can you imagine if during that ticker tape parade you looked up and you saw one of our superstars on one of these duck boats, and instead of laughing and smiling, if, if he was crying. And it tells us that Jesus, in the middle of all this celebration, that he was weeping. It's only the second time that we have seen Jesus weep during his ministry. The first time was when he was at the graveside of one of his friends, Lazarus, and it tells us that he wept there. But now Jesus is weeping during what is supposed to be this triumphal entry. And so the question I have uh, for us today is, why was Jesus weeping at a time when everybody else was celebrating? Luke starts his book uh, back, obviously, in chapter 1, but we were there just a few months ago on Christmas. And you remember when we celebrated Christmas together, and even Christmas Eve night, we were right here in the sanctuary, and we read from Luke chapter 2. And we, we read that familiar verse, uh, that there was a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth. And so Luke starts his gospel, he starts uh, his, his biography of Christ with this great statement, peace on earth. Joseph, when he's told that uh, Mary is going to have a child, remember the angel tells him, and you shall call his name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And so this Messiah who was promised, uh, people, they knew that he was a savior. They knew that he was bringing peace. Yet Jesus, when he rides into Jerusalem, he's weeping. And so why was he weeping? I think he was weeping because he was seeing the rejection of so many people. John said this way, he said, he came to his own and his own received him not. You know, just a few verses prior to where we started this morning, if you go back in Luke 19 to verse 14, it says that he will not have, or we will not have this man to reign over us. And so even though the people at this exact moment are cheering for him, we know that there was rejection of Christ. I think he's weeping because he's looking back and he's seeing how these people, this nation, all of these people had wasted their opportunity to come to see him as the Messiah. As it says at the end of this reading that we did, they were ignorant of this time of visitation. So Jesus is weeping because many have rejected him. Some would say that it's even worse, not just rejecting Christ, but that some people, they accepted him, or at least they feigned acceptance, but then they acted in ways completely opposite. 
Can't you just see Jesus riding in, seeing people who pretended to be religious, people who were acting as religious leaders, but instead their religion was completely empty? If you continue on in Luke chapter 20, you see that after this parade, after Jesus goes into Jerusalem, one of the next things that he does is he goes to the temple, and he refers to the temple as a den of thieves. The religious leaders there not only rejected him, but they were planning to kill him. I think Jesus was crying because there was a great rejection of him as the Messiah. But there was also great confusion. It says right here that uh, people, they rejoiced and they praised God with a loud voice and they saw the mighty works that he had done. But I think that they misunderstood what he was saving them from. Remember, uh, when the angel said to Joseph, he will save people from their sins, it almost feels like some people missed the last part of that phrase. You see, to the Jews who were living this out in real time, they were under Roman occupation. And so when they heard that there was a Messiah who was coming, I think it would have been a natural assumption, a very easy thing to go to, that this Messiah, this Savior, was coming to save them from their oppressors. That maybe he was coming as a military general to free them um, from this occupation. Maybe he was coming as a political leader who would lead them into their next chapter. And so Jesus was certainly misunderstood. Even his own disciples, we read, uh, they said to him, when you set up your kingdom, can we be with you? Can, you, can we be, with you, be on your cabinet? Can we sit on your left hand and on your right hand? And so there was great confusion. I think that was one of the reasons why Christ was weeping. But he was also weeping, I believe, because he was looking ahead. He was not just looking ahead um, to what was the future of everyone else, but certainly his own future. He knew that his life was about to change, that he would be arrested, that he would be falsely accused, that he would be beaten, that he would be isolated, and that he would suffer on the cross. But he also knew that because of the rejection of many, that there would be a great downfall of Jerusalem. Even the temple would eventually be destroyed. Scripture tells us that not one stone would rest upon another, and we know that that came to be true. And so Jesus is weeping for all of these reasons. But if you continue into chapter 20, there's a kind of a hopeful next piece of the story. It says there in Luke chapter 20, verse 1, it says, Now it happened on one of those days, as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel. So it's kind of interesting if you um, read through all four gospels and put them side by side and figure out, okay, what exactly happened in between Palm Sunday and what we call Easter Sunday? What happened on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday? But if you put them side by side, it, it looks like that this uh, verse right here would take place on Tuesday. And it says that on Tuesday that he went to the temple in order to preach the gospel. And so even though he knew what was coming, Christ remained true to his calling, to his purpose. He wanted to do the will of the Father. And for these next few days, that meant that he continued to share the gospel. And the question is then, what is the gospel? What was Jesus actually sharing? And so I want to uh, share with you um, a little uh, drawing. Uh, I didn't come up with it, somebody else did, uh, but I found it to be very helpful, and I think you, you might find it to be helpful too, that explains a little bit of what the gospel is. So let me draw that for you this morning. And I'm going to uh, do it with uh, a couple of circles. So this first circle right here, uh, we're going to call this circle brokenness. Brokenness. And so when we think about brokenness, uh, we can include in brokenness anything uh, that causes pain, suffering, disappointment, um, sickness, suffering, Death, we could even include in that COVID-19, the coronavirus. 
And so we could list all of those things right here. They would all fit in in this circle called brokenness. I'm not a good artist, but if we kind of draw some cracks here, we can see that uh, our world is very fragile. And it's cracking up, if I can put it that way. And as a result of um, this brokenness, uh, there's more brokenness that happens. So let me explain to you what I mean by that. A brokenness, I think, can be defined in two ways. The first way is the things that we do that are broken. And then the second way are all the things that are done to us uh, that are broken as well. So let me give you an example. Uh, many people str struggle with addictions, all types of addictions that people struggle with. And uh, many times, uh, not always, but many times, people who are struggling in some form of addiction, they're doing something in reaction to someone else's brokenness. And so they may be trying to cover up for it, they may be trying to kind of medicate it, they may be trying to just deaden it or, or just move on. They're trying to come up with some way to get past it. And as you know, uh, an addiction is really a form of brokenness. And so when you take the original brokenness and then you add to it uh, our brokenness, what do you get? You get more brokenness. And, and that's, what, that's what happens is that this brokenness creates all sorts of new ways to be broken. Here's another example, the coronavirus. So this isn't something that any of us caused. We're not responsible for it. Uh, we didn't do it. Uh, this is an example of brokenness that has happened to us. But in response to that, we have seen some really sad things. So maybe you saw this week uh, where people were uh, found to be hoarding different supplies and keeping those from people who needed, especially uh, this protective equipment that people in the health industry field need. And sometimes they're hoarding it, uh, but then other times, not only are they hoarding it, but they're putting it up for sale, but at these crazy inflated prices. And uh, so that's been on the news a bunch this week. But that's an example of uh, a brokenness that exists, this coronavirus, and then somebody's broken response to it. And again, brokenness plus brokenness always equals more brokenness. And so this, this circle right here, this is all of the suffering, all of the pain, all of the hurt in the world. And it oftentimes leads to some really good questions. So here's a very common question. If God is so good, then why are all these bad things happening? That's a really good question. Sometimes it's asked this way. If God is a God of love, why is there so much suffering in the world? Uh, another way of, of asking it is, why do bad things happen to good people? And so we can answer that with adding to this. So let me draw another circle. And so this circle right here, we're gonna call God's God's perfect design. God's perfect design. So if you go back to the very first page of your Bible, the very first verse, Genesis chapter one, verse one, it says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And if you read the next few verses after that, it gives the biblical account of the beginning of the world. And when God is, when he's finished creation, he says at the end, he says, it's good, it's good. And so we have that first couple, Adam and Eve, Living in, living in this world which God has created, and everything is good. So Adam and Eve, they're good with each other, and both of them are good with God. And so there's, there's no problems. There's no suffering. There's no pain. Uh, there's, there's nothing uh, that is causing them any sort of misery. 
So where does the misery come from? Where does the suffering come from? So this goes back to that question, um, if God is good, why are there so many bad things? So where did the bad things come from? Well, if you continue to read in, in that Genesis account of creation, you see that God gave them tremendous blessing. Um, but one of the things that he said was, is that you can't do this one thing. You can't eat from this one particular tree. And this happened to you growing up, it happened to me. Mom makes some chocolate chip cookies, don't eat these, we're saving these for after dinner, and what's the one thing you can think about? All you can think about is eating these chocolate chip cookies. And Adam and Eve are told not to do one thing, and what do they do? They eat of this tree. It's a result of them choosing to go against God's word that sin enters into the world. So sin, sin is anything we do that goes against God's perfect design. And so when we ask this good question of, if God is so good, why do we have suffering? If God is a God of love, why do we have uh, so much pain? Why do good people have bad things happen to them? The answer is not because God is a God of hate, or because God doesn't care, or because God is not aware. The answer to these questions is this. When God was in charge, it was a perfect design, and everything was good. But it's when we decided to go against him and go our own way, that's when all of this brokenness began to happen. So where do we go from here? Let me bring in one more circle. And in this circle, we have Jesus Christ. So uh, one of the questions that is often asked at uh, Easter, and it should be asked, it's a great question, uh, why did Christ come to earth? Why was he born? And the answer is, he was born so that he could die. Uh, Christ came to earth so that he could die on the cross for us. Now, why did Christ have to die on the cross? Here's why. The scriptures tell us that all have sinned. So when I listed off that brokenness a second ago, I'm guessing that everyone had no problem admitting to that there's brokenness in the world. And I don't think that any of us would have a problem saying that we have contributed to that brokenness. And so everyone has done, done some form of sin. If you say, I have never sinned, well then you just sin right there, you told a lie. We've all done something which goes against God's perfect way. As a result of this sin, not only is there brokenness, but now there is a separation from God. There's a separation from God. So here's what's so beautiful about this, this simple drawing. Back to that question, if God is a God of love, then why does all this stuff happen? The answer is, God is a God of love. And because he's a God of love, this is what he did. The scriptures say this, that God demonstrated his love for us. While we were still in our sin and brokenness, Christ died for us. While we were in our sin, Christ died for us. So God, again, his part in the story is not uh, this sin. His part is saving us from this sin, which is what separated us from his perfect design. So because of our brokenness, uh, because of our separation from him, because he cares about us, God chose to send his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross. Now, why did he have to die on the cross? It's very simple. The scriptures tell us that the wage or the penalty for any sin that we do is death. Certainly a, uh, an emotional death, if I can put it that way, this, this separation from God, um, but there is a physical death which, should ha which happens. Uh, we know that um, in the garden there was no death yet, but it wasn't until Adam and Eve chose to go their own way 
that death entered into the world. The penalty for sin is death. But because God is a God of love, he doesn't want us to suffer from that penalty. And so he sent his son, Jesus Christ, who never sinned, to take the penalty for us. Why did Christ die on the cross? He didn't die on the cross because he was paying for his own sins. He died on the cross because he was bearing the sins of the world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And so how do we get from this brokenness to something better? And that's right here, what Christ said, to believe, to believe. We have to turn from our sin. The Bible calls that repentance. We turn from our sin and we turn to Christ. Now there's a lot of different ideas about this. There's a lot of ideas about how we get back to God, but Jesus said, I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one gets back to the Father except through me. And uh, Paul wrote to the Romans, he said, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. When we believe in Christ, when we begin to understand not only our own brokenness, but when we begin to understand God's love demonstrated through Christ on the cross, we then are able to experience what the, what the Bible refers to as new life. We become a new creation. You know, what we're really doing is we're getting back to God's perfect design. Now, we're still stuck here on this broken earth. We still are surrounded by all this brokenness, but we ourselves are no longer stuck here. We find ourselves in Christ getting back to God's perfect design. So question for you. If you look at this drawing, God's perfect design, brokenness, Christ on the cross, and you had to put an X where you are right now, where would you put that X? Where would you put it? Would you put it somewhere over here with brokenness? Would you put it like on your way to believing? Would you put yourself that you have believed and you are finding your way back? Where would you put yourself? It's a question that all of us um, have to answer. In fact, there is an answer. We can't not answer it. Uh, you're somewhere here on this board. You're in this drawing somewhere. Christ said, come to me all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Uh, this week, as we move through the, the passion story, Christ reveals uh, more and more what it means to uh, move from this place of brokenness into this uh, place of belief in him. And so I pray that as we study this story together this week, uh, that you will understand uh, why God sent his son to die, why he died on the cross, uh, what that means to you, and how we can move from this place of brokenness back to God's perfect design. So uh, we'll stop there for this week. I'd love to pray for you, uh, and then we'll be done. Uh, God, I thank you for our church. Uh, wherever people are today, uh, we do know that we live in a broken world. And if we're honest, we have to confess that we have contributed to that brokenness. But thank you that uh, you didn't leave us here in our brokenness. But instead, you chose to send your son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place on the cross, providing a way back to you. I pray for our church this week. We pray for physical protection uh, as, this, um, as the fears of this virus continue to grow. We're seeing more people get sick. 
Uh, we pray that you will protect our church family uh, from this virus. I pray that you'll provide for our needs. We know that uh, more and more of us are um, in a little bit of a financial strain. Uh, some have lost jobs. Uh, some, their hours have been cut back. Uh, you promise that you will provide for us, that you will supply all of our needs. And so I thank you ahead of time how you're going to supply the needs of our church family uh, this week. I pray that you will bless our church. Uh, we're all spread out today. Uh, but we're still one church family. And so I thank you for our church family. And uh, we just ask that you would uh, heal our land, heal us from this virus, and allow us to get back uh, to normal again, but also to get back uh, to worshiping here in our sanctuary with our church family again soon. We pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, let's close our time together with one more song of worship to our God, and let this song be a declaration of who we know our God to be. Two, three. <laughs> Waymaker, man. 
That is who you are. That is who you are. That is who you Thank you for watching this presentation from New England Bible Church. We pray that the message and the music was a real blessing to you today, even through very difficult times. Here at NEBC, we are convinced that God's word speaks authoritatively into even the most difficult situations. If you are just finding us for the first time, head to our website, nebible.org, where you can learn more about who we are and what we believe. Additionally, there you can reach out to the pastoral staff and let us know about any questions or prayer requests that you might have. Additionally, and we want to encourage everybody to do this that may have a need, if you have a need that's associated with the current events, please don't hesitate to reach out. We have so many people who have stepped up with great generosity of doing things and financial gifts. And to that end, we want to remind you that we have online giving. You'll find a link in the description of the video below. And if you head to the website, there's a button on the upper right-hand corner of the page. We are excited to bring messages to you via YouTube, and we're utilizing this medium more as the weeks go on. You'll notice that Pastor Tyler is putting his weekly updates out in video form. We also would encourage you to click on this link right here so that you can subscribe so that our videos show up in your YouTube feed. We pray that God is ministering to you and that you're able to redeem this time, even though it is so incredibly difficult. But we know that he has a plan and that plan includes making his name known. We thank you and God bless.